Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, and I like to think that I can keep calm in a difficult situation based in my background in psychology and criminal justice. But when I had kids, I was constantly questioning if I was doing things right or how I was messing them up this time. Add in a child with a chronic illness and I found myself full of anxiety. Before my son's diagnosis, it felt like every minute was a ticking time bomb. Is now the time that we should go to the hospital? Are they going to tell me there's nothing wrong again? Or am I overthinking it? Sure, I was keeping it together mostly on the outside, but the overwhelm of staying strong for everyone else was constantly threatening to be too much and result in one of those locked in the bathroom for a quick ugly cry moments. You know what I mean. Momsiety is a real thing for every new parent, and when you add in a chronic illness, food allergy, or other challenging circumstances, it can become downright isolating. And that's why the Momsiety Club is here for you. Each week, we'll discuss all things motherhood, so join me and let's get rid of this momsiety together. Welcome to episode 27 of the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm Tori Levine, and I'm so glad you are here. On today's episode, I'll be sharing more of my side of the story about the journey to get my son, my oldest son, diagnosed with very early onset inflammatory bowel disease and managing anxiety throughout that. A few updates and reminders before we get started. First, whether this is your first time listening or your 27th, I personally want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy mom life to listen. Your time is incredibly valuable, and I'm honored that you have set aside some time to join me, whether it's while you're on a walk on your own or multitasking multitasking with a little one in tow. Last week, I began to share a bit more about my anxiety journey and received some great feedback from the episode as well as some past episodes. I love hearing from each of you and whether you've listened for the very, from the very beginning or are new to listening, whenever you're ready to reach out and say hello, please do so. You can find me on social media at at Momsiety Club or reach out via email hello at momsietyclub.com. And remember, it's M O M X I E T Y. Or if you just want to give a five star rating or review on Apple or Spotify, I would love to thank you on an upcoming episode. Don't forget to access your free resource with ways to reduce mom anxiety, either via the link to the free resources in the show notes or on the app that you're listening to or at momsietyclub.com slash 27. If you're already on the Momsiety Club email list, you have access to this episode freebie and past freebies via the free resources page that you get a link to each week in your email. If you are not yet on that list, simply sign up to receive free resources at join.momsietyclub.com. Again, the link is in the show notes and you will automatically be added and stay updated on any future specials or new offers from the Momsiety Club. A big special that is coming to your inbox soon is the ability to join in and try out a Momsiety Club session, a combination of support and exercise for new and not so new moms. So if you're not already on the list, make sure you sign up today. Okay, one more thing, please hit the subscribe button in your podcast app if you have not yet. That way you get the newest episodes downloaded right to your phone so your busy mom brain doesn't have one more thing to remember. And that also helps others find the podcast as well. Okay, in last week's episode, I began to share a bit more of my anxiety journey before and after having my first child and then discuss some of the symptoms we were seeing and what led to led us to a pediatric GI's office. Here's a little recap in case you forgot or if you haven't gotten a chance to listen to that episode yet. 
Ruben, my oldest, um, was a spitter upper, <laughs> I like to say, from the time that he was born. We later, a few months down the line, found out that he had some food sensitivities to dairy and soy. And then later, once we introduced salads, he, we found out that he had an intolerance sensitivity to gluten. We were able to add dairy and soy back in between one and two years, but when we started seeing bright red blood clots and mucusy stool, we thought it was um, because he had accidentally gotten gluten a few times, either you know, something wasn't labeled properly or possibly something had been contaminated because after several calls and trips to the doctor, many doctors, um, now they were not his pediatrician because she was out on maternity leave, but we were always told nothing was wrong. So that it was just toddler constipation. So in my mind, that plus the same symptoms he had from having like gluten in his food that's what it was. So when my son's pediatrician was back from maternity leave, we actually got an appointment with her the day she first came back. Um, she was concerned, ran some base tests, and was able to get us in to a pediatric GI at Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital, which um, I think it's been Penn State Children's Hospital for a long time, but I always associate Hershey with it. So that's beside the point. But That's where I left off last week saying that we met with the GI, uh, Dr. Javari, um, was his name and he was amazing, not alarmist, not laissez-faire, just direct with what all it could be, why he didn't think it was certain things and how we were going to cross possible diagnoses off the list with the next steps of testing and so on. So between the time of chatting with a doctor we knew just kind of asking a few questions in the beginning of May and the whirlwind of escalating symptoms and then the referrals to get Ruben a GI appointment by mid-May, I of course doctor googled everything and figured out in my own mind what was going on and that was that it was either celiac or somehow Crohn's disease, even though all of my my <laughs> research on Google only revealed that IBD was like an adult diagnosis or much, much older children. Well, in our appointment with the pediatric GI, he mentioned that Crohn's IBD was one of the last things that it could that could be going on, but based on Ruben's age and even though the initial blood draw with the ESR being a little elevated, but the other inflammatory marker that really they look at uh, for IBD wasn't elevated, um, the doctor wasn't really overly concerned that we were dealing with IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, but once other diagnoses were ruled out, we would look into testing for that. So additional labs and stool samples, specifically a fecal calprotectin, were ordered and a CT scan to see if it was something called Meckel's diverticulum. Um, And the CT scan was then set for the next week. At this point, uh, Ruben had had enough labs drawn and things going on that he knew what was going on and what was coming. So as soon as we were in a lab chair, I was convinced that people two buildings down could hear him screaming um, because he would just get so worked up because he knew what was going to happen and anxious. I felt horrendous having to basically bear hug him and leg lock him while he was sitting on my lap while two or more nurses or lab techs tried to hold his arm and draw blood. And this, the first few times distractions with like construction videos on our phones worked. Um, but that also required having somebody else there. So like my husband would have to be there to hold that part. So it was like four people on one little child. So yes, I remember trying to remain calm while I was ready to lose it because I was so upset that he was getting so upset. 
you know, going to have to do a lab draw or anything like that, my heart would just race. And then at the end of it, my heart would continue racing. I would have a headache, feel like my blood pressure was through the roof because I didn't think that I could relax until we were home and like sitting there reading books and he was finally calm. I just remember that even the band-aid after just that, you know, had to stay on to clot from where the, the blood draw was taken, that until that was off, he was in hysterics, which, you know, as a parent, what, what can you do? Because you try to say like, okay, it's over. But with a three-year-old, it, it was, yeah, I just didn't know what to do honestly. But then on the other hand, even if we were home and he was calm, could I really relax? Because then I wanted to know immediately what the lab results were. Because even after you've had like a couple of lab results, if there are specific things that the doctors are looking at, you can kind of get an idea by checking them out. Um, So there was that anxiety as well. So This time then, one of the added uh, tests was a fecal calprotectin, which came back with a result of above 800, which, you know, I'm not sure if it's the same way everywhere, but you generally get the lab results and it says, you know, within range, low, high, or, you know, there's like a little exclamation, I can't talk, exclamation mark there. Um, And so... Some of them even told us what the normal range was. And for this, the normal range was below 50. So again, with my MD from Google, I went and reaffirmed my belief that we were dealing with some type of inflammatory bowel disease because, you know, that's what I had in my head. But I was still, you know, I think that was my biggest fear of what it was going to be. I was still optimistic that the CT scan would come back um, and show that it was this Meckel's diverticulum, which is kind of what uh, the pediatric GI had said. That That's like the most common thing. He was at the right age. That happens like right around or before two years old. Um, so we were hoping for that. But at the same time, not because – that that required a surgery to fix. And in the back of my, my head, I knew like, okay, that's fine. But it's scary when your child has not had to undergo any type of medical procedure like that. Um, and you're hoping for the good outcome that it is this diagnosis so that the surgery can fix it. But you don't want them to have surgery. So it was this like, it was a very weird feeling. Well, then the CT scan came and that was a lot of, again, having to handle Ruben and trying to get him through it calmly. Um, Where we were, (laughs) like he was doing great, everything. He had to have an IV placed because I think there was a, um, if I remember correctly, they had to put in like a contrast um, for the CT scan. But I remember I was just like, he had finally calmed down from the IV placement, which I had to calm down from too, because they were, they missed a few times or it rolled out because he was so small, but he freaked out because he thought the machine was going to crush him because basically for this test, it had to come up like right on his belly. So yeah, I like I said, like my husband had to try to keep Ruben and me calm because of everything that was going on. After that, we pretty much quickly got the negative test result back. And Ruben's doctor, the GI, wanted to get scopes done as soon as possible since all the other things like we had ruled out. So we were able to get in with, I think, that week's on-call doctor and slipped in another like emergency time slot that she had on her procedure schedule. So he was scheduled for an EGD, an upper and lower endoscopy. 
while we didn't have much time to fret (laughs) and get anxious about um, the procedure, it also, I remember that, you know, week, not even a full week in between, the time just felt so long. Like I needed an answer. Um, as well as I think I was most anxious on how he was going to react. I was worried they were going to, you know, wheel him away from us and him be screaming. Um, but his CT scan well, through the children's hospital was actually in like the main adult hospital. So we had a little bit of a, you know, not the children's hospital experience. And then this procedure was 100% within the children's hospital. So they really came in, the doctors, anesthesiologists, nurses, all came in and kind of walked us through what was going to happen. And we're really happy that they encouraged parents to stay with their child as long as they could until they were sedated. So that's what happened. My son wanted me to ride on the gurney with him. And so that's what we did. My, I sat there, held him. My husband walked beside us and walked all the way to the procedure room. And we were there to kind of, you know, comfort him while he was being sedated. We began to get a little worried then after we were waiting in the waiting room for over an hour for the procedure we were told was going to be, you know, 45 minutes maximum, including when they would come out and talk to us. But we were soon then notified that everything was going fine, but just taking a little bit longer. Um, The pediatric GI who performed the procedures spoke with us after the procedure and spent a great deal of time explaining her findings, what they all meant, as well as why the procedure took longer than expected. So he, our son, ended up needing a breathing tube during the procedure um, since he was so small and had so much inflammation and irritation. She said she had to proceed very slowly as to not cause, you know, excessive bleeding in his intestine from the scopes hitting that inflammation. So then even though Ruben's GI, he was either book solid or in a conference that day, um, he got away and was able to come up and talk to us briefly. He came up to the aftercare area for a good 20 minutes before we left, um, to make sure we knew what the next steps in Ruben's care plan were going to be. We left the hospital comforted by all the care from the entire team. And we then went to Hershey Chocolate World um, after discharge and had some lunch to try to get some food in him since not having solid food for 24 hours. Um, And then we went home and had a good afternoon and good evening. Uh, Then things kind of turned south. Uh, As bedtime neared, our son's breathing started to sound like he had a bit of congestion, Um, but he went to bed fine and we checked on him hourly. As I was getting ready for bed then, I heard him rustle and when I went in to check on him again, um, at this point he was having trouble breathing. It pretty much sounded like he was having an asthma attack even though he doesn't have asthma or a history of asthma. We tried to get him to drink, thinking maybe the air was too dry, um, but he said it hurt his throat and he was still gasping for air. We luckily had a nebulizer from when a cold lingered a few months previously, so gave that to him and while my husband was on the phone with the on-call attending who had completed Ruben's procedure. Um, We didn't really know if the raspiness was wheezing, if it was normal after having to be intubated during his scopes. So she said it's not normal, and if it started again within two hours um, since having the nebulizer treatment, then to go straight to the ER. So there we go. We were about 10 minutes later and it started again and we threw on clothes, threw some clothes in a bag and headed back to the hospital. Now, 
here we were like, we had this debate while we were trying to get everything together. Do we go to the closest ER or do we drive an extra 20 minutes to get to Hershey, which has a separate pediatric ER, and that's where he had his procedure earlier. After the treatment, we figured we had enough time. We could finish the treatment, put him right in the car, and go to Hershey to be where he was earlier in that day. So they have their own separate pediatric ER and everyone was amazing to with how they spoke with us with Ruben how they explained everything and then after several hours in the ER you know medicine some other nebulizer type treatments that really helped his breathing uh, and a little rest on and off we headed up to the pediatric floor in the children's hospital because they wanted to admit him just overnight at least for observation so After the initial check-in upstairs, they let us all rest as much as possible. And again, all the team members did an incredible job with Ruben, with us, making sure that we understood everything and getting us anything that we needed. I can't remember the movie that we watched, but I just remember, you know, I held Ruben all night in the little chair in the room. My husband slept on the, you know, the couch bed type thing. And we basically just tried to have a movie on to distract him. Hopefully he would fall asleep. And, you know, if not, we would just get some sleep the next day. Well, luckily he didn't need any further treatments. He was doing well, you know, and so they said if we were comfortable, they were comfortable having him go home, that there shouldn't be any other issues again. Basically, the next few days and weeks were kind of like a flurry of learning how to have an almost three-year-old take medication twice daily. Uh, We were told that Ruben's GI was going to be referring us down to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia uh, for their very early onset inflammatory bowel disease uh, clinic that they have. And we were really just trying to figure it all out and awaiting for our appointment at CHOP. And there was definitely a lot of what does this mean? You know, how often would we need to travel to Philadelphia? All these different things. But uh, we were able to, Ruin was able to get an appointment in less than a month. Um, They, I believe they did their clinics like once a month or once every two weeks. And we were able to get in to a slot at the end of, actually mid-June, because it was actually right before he turned three. Um, But I still, I feel like I have a, a photographic memory of driving into the CHOP campus, the Penn um, Hospital campus there for the adults, everything. It's all right next to each other. And just, you know, feeling this gratitude, fear, and, and guilt even because we were so grateful to be so close, living within, you know, two-ish hours of CHOP, um, that we had insurance, that we were able to go and seek a second opinion, seek treatment there, and that at the same time, like, knowing all the different things that families and children are are dealing with, you know, right on the other side of that window or that, that hallway in the hospital, you know, of, can I feel upset? Like it was one of those, can I feel upset when there's somebody else who's having something, you know, far worse happening to them? Uh, one of those, those situations, which, um, I don't know if anyone else has experienced that, but, um, yeah. So then we went to CHOP. We met with 
one of the doctors, Dr. Conrad, who specializes in very early onset inflammatory bowel disease, which is um, onset prior to six years old, I believe. We, you know, discussed symptoms. They had gotten all the results from Hershey and were sending biopsies to the lab there. Uh, They did some more blood tests. They there they do so much research. So part of the labs were even for research, which we were more than happy to do because they were already drawn blood. They didn't have to do another poke. And basically we're just said, you know, if he's doing well with the medication he was on, then, you know, just maintain that. And we would kind of follow up or could even refer back out to the doctor at Hershey. So, um, we kind of had a little bit of a game plan, a little bit better of an understanding. One of the, the really great things too, is that they have families meet with a specialized dietitian down there, um, who works just with IBD, VEO, IBD kids. Um, so that was something else that, you know, kind of educated us because I'm very much, The more education I have on something, the less anxiety I have. So we left with, you know, information. And if something came up prior to that, we were able to email, call, anything, and we could reassess the situations. For about three or four months or so, Ruben was doing well. Things kind of had plateaued um, and anxieties had calmed a bit, but, you know, three or four months later, we started noticing some things again. The anxiety started creeping back up when he was, you know, using the bathroom more often, um, maybe not eating as much as he had been previously. So I called or emailed and chatted with a doctor and kind of determined that, he needed scopes again, um, which then, as if my anxiety wasn't, you know, worried about how his stomach, his insides were doing, it was now, oh God, the last time he had this, this, we had to rush him to the ER. So I was like, okay, so that's going to happen again. Um, well, no, that's not what happened. Well, you know, the back and forth between setting up the procedure and the doctors and everything, like we didn't even, we came to find out when the anesthesiologist came in to talk with us prior to the procedure that the only reason that that happened, the breathing issues, was not an anesthesia issue or reaction, which is kind of what we had thought. It was because there had been a circumstance of, you know, the wrong size intubation tube or scopes were used and he was too small for them. And so, you know, they assured us that was not going to happen. And I honestly was on edge until the next day because just seeing that, yeah, it didn't happen. (laughs) He was good. We didn't have to, you know, rush back to the hospital. Well, this procedure went really fast and Dr. Conrad came out and spoke with us, you know, kind of gave us the info on, you know, they, the lab was going to look at his biopsies, you know, what she saw, what type of inflammation, you know, mild, moderate, severe. It was kind of like low, moderate. And basically that this probably meant we were going to have to change medication, but wanted to wait on the pathologies to come back just to ensure that it wasn't some hidden food allergy that, you know, the markers for IBD were there. Um, so we then spoke with Dr. Conrad over the phone, and she basically explained everything of the next steps, the def- different options that were available for medications, so that I could talk to Isaac about it. We would meet and have 
a doctor's appointment for Ruben and decide on our next steps. So we ended up going the infusion route, vedalizumab or Entivio, uh, the brand name, and that was something we were very concerned about because I was thinking this is going to be awful for over 45 minutes. It's just going to be him screaming and because of the IV. You know, I was thinking like lap draw where there's a needle in there the whole time, not IV <laughs> that gets put in, taped on, and it's like a little straw. So that was a huge relief then after his first infusion. Um, it was, it was a lot, definitely. Um, they do like a loading dose where he, he would have to go in every, you know, I think it was one week, then two weeks, then four weeks, um, and then six weeks. And there, the, the thing is, there's no no set schedule that says this is the right amount. It varies from person to person based on their biology and severity of disease and all those things. So it, it, it was a long play at figuring out the right dosage, as well as this medication takes a little longer to kick in uh, than some of the others. But we were able to choose this based on his level of inflammation. Um, I'm trying to think, it probably took a year to figure out the right dosage. And the anxiety during that year pretty much was from, you know, how's the infusion going to (laughs) go? How is he going to manage it? We tried to do the best we could to make a good situation out of a, you know, not so fun thing um, where, you know, the first time we went down and had his infusion, we went to the Please Touch Museum in Philly. Another time, amazing friends of ours invited us over for dinner on the way home. And the hospital was incredible. They have child life specialist, Miss Caitlin, still one of my favorites to see when we're there (laughs) um, for infusions. But just with providing all the different things, helping with distractions, having everything right there and, you know, little prizes, we still have the little matchbox garbage truck that he got from the hospital on his um, first infusion. And I don't know that I'll ever be able to get rid of that just because it is, again, one of those heartwarming, heartbreaking feelings, thoughts, memories. But yeah, I'm getting lost going down memory lane now here. (laughs) But some of the other stuff we had to deal with was insurance denials. And boy, oh boy, did that, uh, that suck. It was awful um, to be told that this stuff that's really helping your child, this amazing medicine that is helping your child, too bad. Sorry, you can't have it again. Um, we're not paying for it. So he has to now go off of his schedule that's working for him. What happened is he was on it every four weeks And we got this insurance denial. So we had to switch and say, um, go to every six weeks since that's what the insurance would allow. Um, Or figure out how to come up with uh, $27,000, $30,000 every four weeks to pay for it. So we had one insurance denial. Things got fixed. Another insurance denial a little bit later and just just lots of fighting with the insurance company and thankfully we did not have to do a lot of that that was the hospital his doctor a lot of peer-to-peer calls and throughout that time was when I really had my hardest time with anxiety because then 
anytime he said, you know, maybe his belly hurt. He was a three-year-old, a four-year-old. They have belly aches. Is it normal? Is it a flare-up happening? Is he building antibodies to the medicine? Did the medicine stop working? How many times is he going to the bathroom? All these things. I felt like I was the poo examiner and that was my job. Pretty much any time there was anything, I would immediately jump to, is this a flare? This is a flare. And during that time, I definitely kind of felt lost either with my own friends, mom's groups, you know, almost jealous of other parents because at least from the outside, you know, you can never now tell really what's going on. But I was like, well, they don't have to worry about all these extra things. Um, these extra appointments, these once every four weeks or every six weeks, the, you know, gut wrenching time of having their, their kid go and get an IV placed, you know, the time leading up to the infusion. I really wish I didn't have an infusion. I don't like it. Um, those types of things. And, and even just the anxiety that that brought out in him with any type of medical visit. Um, he, I just remember one of his doctor's appointments, his well visits. He's like, I'm not, do I need, he, he was like, do I need to get a shot? And his doctor answered him in the beginning. And there was screaming the rest of the time because he was just so worked up about it. Um, but magically, <laughs> one day at gymnastics, a mom of another child in his class and I were chatting and it turns out she has to get, she had to give her daughter shots at home and her daughter was seen down at CHOP too. And it's just like this great coincidence of things and just chatting and actually being a little bit vulnerable and being open. And we just talked about our experiences with our kids, with these kind of medical difficulties, medical challenges. And I walked out and walked away feeling like there was this gigantic weight lifted off of me because I was not alone, that I was not the only one feeling this, that, you know, other people do feel it as well. So thank you to that mom. You know who you are. And I just want to share this story. I know it's kind of all over the place and I apologize <laughs> For that, I'm really, I really just want to be honest and vulnerable and real to help you, to help you know that you can trust your gut, that you need to advocate for your child, that if there is something going on with your child, you are not alone. These feelings you're having of gratitude, fear, guilt, anger, jealousy, questioning, sadness, grief, and anxiety. They are valid. You can have those feelings. Give yourself some time. Don't just push them away. Sometimes the best self-care, the realistic self-care that we can do for ourselves is to acknowledge, accept, and hold space for those feelings. So I will say it again. You are not alone. If you don't feel like you have anyone to talk to, I'm here. Reach out to me on social media. The links are down in the bio. I'm at Momsiety Club on social media, or you can reach out via email. There were a lot of times I wanted to pick up the phone and talk to another mom who was going through the same thing, something similar, or was a few steps ahead of me. I loved being able to go to the online forums and ask questions or read about others' experiences with a medication, a diet, a treatment, uh, or how things were being handled at school. But I needed to be able to find a group that I just could talk to about 
the emotions and anxieties that are part of mothering a child who's facing medical challenges, whatever they may be. That's one of the reasons I love the Momsiety Club community, why the community from former Mommy and Me classes, the Mommy Bar classes that I taught has grown and changed, and why I'm bent on sustaining and continuing to grow the Momsiety Club. It sometimes is hard to find where you fit or feel at home during challenging times, but I'm here to be vulnerable and share what I have learned. And so are so many other moms in the group. If I or another mom is one, two, three, however many steps ahead of where you are right now in motherhood, in seeking a diagnosis, in dealing with any type of challenge in motherhood, I'm here. So with the Momsiety Club podcast, I'm committed to sharing these kinds of stories with you. And I'm committed with the Momsiety Club to maintaining and expanding that place where you are safe to share your thoughts, your worries, emotions, and even just vent sometimes. A place where the physical and emotional support necessary for motherhood are all woven together. You know, with my background in dance and psychology, movement has had such a profound effect on me and I know what that does, how that affects mental health and emotions and using movement to escape from those anxieties. It has just a way to actually kind of like flip a switch in your brain. I know it's a silly way to talk about it, but it it actually does. And Now I'm going to get a little um, nerdy about science and movement, but there are studies and I will link to the book that this is from, The Joy of Movement, in the show notes. But, But in the book, it discusses studies that looked at how exercise in participants prior to being given a drug that basically induced a panic attack affected their symptoms after being given this drug. And when they had exercised for 30 minutes prior to being given this drug that induces severe anxiety and racing heartbeat and breathlessness, um, it basically was the equivalent of giving them an Ativan, which can calm anxiety, but it can also leave you very drowsy. And exercise for 30 minutes prior to being given this drug to induce a panic attack gave them all those calming effects, but without the real sedation and drowsiness. So that's pretty awesome. And there's been other studies that show that a single event of physical activity immediately decreases anxiety, uh, reduced rumination, basically those thoughts and worries going around and around in our head. So that is one of the reasons that a dance break, um, flipping on some music and just dancing around or going for a walk are the top things that are recommended as ways to reduce your anxiety uh, in the moment. And sometimes it's hard to remember to do it. Um, but that is also why we do weekly classes in the Momsiety Club as well because then you get that community support and I teach you ways of exercising with your child, however that is, making it fun, um, tips for doing things on your own just to flip that switch in your brain and really give you a time to get the worries out of your head, focus on something else, And when you get to do it with your child, you're also getting some special bonding that can be hard, if not impossible, when there are all these worries just ruminating in your head. I know 100% because it happened to me a lot. Again, if you have questions, I would love to connect with you. So reach out. All right. I just want to tie all this up together and say that I wanted to share this story so that it could help you, help a mom you know, um, just feel seen. And because when I spoke to that mom at gymnastics the one day, I felt 
seen and like my emotions, my feelings were all validated. My worries um, were validated. And, and honestly, that's how I felt when I went to my first new mom's group that I said saved me because new motherhood, there is all of this in there. You get those same feelings of happiness, sadness, gratitude, uh, grief, jealousy, all those things. I remember very clearly at new motherhood too, but I guess if I'm going to compare the two, kind of dealing with a diagnosis and having a child with a chronic illness or medical condition or some other type of disability kind of can be like new motherhood each and every single time something else happens because it's new. And I really just wanted and needed to create that community for others. You know, just we can all have our own hard times and we can share them. We can help each other. We can acknowledge that your heart is different than my heart. My heart is different than your heart. But guess what? We still are having a hard day or a hard time. So reach out. Connect with me on social media. Email me. Connect with another mom. Share this with another mom. Even if it maybe if you don't really feel comfortable saying this yet, saying your thoughts and feelings and difficulties, share this and kind of say, Hey, this is kind of how I feel. Um, but I want to help you. I'm here. So thank you so much for joining me and listening. Reach out if this resonated and until next time, I'll catch you on social media and inside the club. The Momxiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. The Momxiety Club membership is full of a group of amazingly supportive moms and pre- and postnatal fitness tips and exercises to help you mentally and physically. The first month's fee for all new members this month is being donated to the Children's Miracle Network. When you're ready to join other mamas getting through the ups, downs, and anxieties of motherhood, head to join.momxietyclub.com to become a member and check out the Ultimate Momxiety Relief Package.